Well, thank you so much, friends, for your welcome today. It's good to be with you again, and um, um, well, thank you for your warmth of fellowship last time I came, and uh, it's good to be back with you today. Um, thank you for opening in prayer, brother. That's, uh, that's always good, good to, to start with prayer. I got prayer on my list to be the first thing, so as our brother has prayed, that's great. Um, now, I, can I just, um, just point out that all the hymns today, the four hymns today, have some reference to the word gospel. Now, actually, when I look through the hymn book, there are not that many hymns which actually have, I, I'm not saying there are, not, there are lots of hymns about the gospel, but that specifically use the word gospel. There are one or two others uh, that I've not chosen here, and, and one that I did hope for, which was in the old Christian hymns, but isn't in this one, so there we are. But uh, these, I hope, will be um, a help to us today as we think of these things. And so we're going to uh, uh, turn now to number 150. Great is the gospel of our glorious God, where mercy met the anger of God's rod. And then you'll find in the other hymns, there is at least somewhere in the, in the hymn some reference to the gospel and to the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, but this is a great hymn to begin our worship. So let's... Uh, Stand to sing, thank you. <clears throat> as we think of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, it is so important to uh, be reminded of the wonders of what the Lord Jesus came to do for us. 
and uh, today, um, children, is Palm Sunday. And uh, am, I, am I allowed to ask questions? Well, I will. Um, who can tell me the significance of Palm Sunday? What do we do? Yes, please. Well done, excellent. I'm sorry, I haven't got any sweets to give you or prizes, but well done, thank you. Maybe I'll do that another time. No, no, I'm not, I'm not actually sure that's a good idea, so I know some people do that. But anyway, well done, young man. Good. Uh, that's the day that the Lord Jesus Christ rode into Jerusalem. Now, in the Old Testament, we have a lot of prophecies about the coming of the Lord Jesus and about his death and about his resurrection. Some many years ago, uh, when I was uh, the pastor in St. Ives in Cornwall for 21 years, I was down there uh, for one year, I, I spoke on Easter Sunday about 25 Old Testament prophecies. It's all right, it wasn't a very long sermon, but it, you know, 25 <laughs> prophecies of the Old Testament that were fulfilled about the Lord Jesus Christ's resurrection, just about the resurrection. Lots and lots of prophecies in the Old Testament. And we're going to turn now in the Bible to um, Isaiah, to perhaps one of, the, one, of the, one of the best known, well, the most significant passages perhaps in the Old Testament to speak about the work of the Lord Jesus. It's a prophecy of, of, of Isaiah. Uh, and then we'll say a little bit more about the Palm Sunday as well. Um, to the children in a moment or two. But let's turn now to this reading in the Bible from Isaiah. We're going to start in chapter 52. Hopefully, uh, I think that's right. I'm not very good at seeing this from here. 32, yes, verse 13. And we're going to read on into chapter 53, the whole of the chapter, because it tells us about, this is all a prophecy about the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you read the word servant, you think of the Lord Jesus, who was God the Father's servant. He was also his son, obviously, the son of God, God the son. But he's also the servant. And um, some years ago, I was talking to a man, uh, or I, I knew a man who uh, sought to bring the gospel to uh, Jewish people. And he was talking to a rabbi. And he quoted from this passage in Isaiah. And the rabbi turned to my friend, because he knew that my friend read the Old Testament, the New Testament as well. And he said, well, of course, the New Testament writers would say that about the Lord Jesus. And my friend turned the Bible round to the rabbi, and he realized that he was reading from Isaiah from the Old Testament. The rabbi recognized that this was about the Lord Jesus. And the rabbi was annoyed because he thought my friend was reading from the New Testament. The rabbi didn't even know his Old Testament. So there we are. So here's a passage about the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's read these words. Isaiah 52 from verse 13. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him, for that which has not been told them they see, and that which they have not heard they understand." Who has believed what he has heard from us? Who has believed our report, our testimony, the old version says? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of a dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. 
but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked, and with a rich, with a rich man in his death. Although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for, 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 for guilt, for sin, he shall see his offspring, he shall prosper, he shall prolong his days. I'm sorry, I know this so well in the old version that I keep reading it, forgive me, forgive me. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Now, it's not my purpose to stop and preach on that passage, but it's a wonderful passage telling us of how God the Father and God the Son were involved together in this great plan of salvation in the gospel. What's gospel? Does anyone, can any of the young people tell me what the word gospel means? Have you been told that? Oh, we've got a bright boy at the back. Yes, my friend. The good news. Absolutely. That's another. My, if you were in my, my class, I'd give you full marks and put you to the top of the class. Well done. Good news. Good news. The good news of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's right. And this has come about because the Lord Jesus Christ died for our sins. We know that, don't we? And if you just look at verse 6 of chapter 53, it reminds us of where we were, where we are. If we're not the Lord Jesus, if we haven't followed him, if we've not served him, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. We've gone away. But God, the Lord, Jehovah, the Lord, the Father, has laid upon him our iniquity and our sin. And I don't know whether you know Handel's Messiah. I like Handel's Messiah. It's, it takes lots of the passages of the Bible and sets them to music. And in Handel's Messiah, when he gets to this verse, he, he has a very uh, uh, sort of um, happy a carefree tune for the first part. All we like sheep have gone astray. I'm not going to sing it to you. When I was younger, I would, I would have sung it because I've sung it in choirs. And it's a, a sort of jiggy, uh, you know, sort of a happy, couldn't care less tune. And, that's what, and then the Lord and the music becomes solemn. It becomes serious. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That wasn't fun. That wasn't happy. But the only way to have true happiness is to know the Lord Jesus as our Savior. And that's the point that Handel is trying to make in the Messiah. There we are. We think we're happy. But actually, we're not really happy until we know the Lord Jesus Christ. Until we know that the Lord, God the Father, has put on him our sin. And we are set free. And then... And later in the Messiah, he speaks about the joy of what we have in Christ. And the end of it comes to those wonderful words in the book of Revelation. Worthy is the lamb that was slain. And it's 
happy and rejoicing and full of praise to the wonder of what God has done for us. So you think of that Palm Sunday. Next week is Easter Sunday. And even more, you'll be able to praise him for the wonder of the gospel of his grace. Well, let's turn now to another hymn. And this hymn also speaks of the Lord Jesus Christ and the gospel, 537. Come, let us sing of a wonderful love, tender and true, out of the heart of the Father above, streaming to me and to you. Verse 2, Jesus the Savior, this gospel to tell, joyfully came, 537. <laughs> to turn now to our New Testament reading in 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 1, 1 Timothy chapter 1. <clears throat> 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope. To Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than the stewardship of from God that is by faith. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. Now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, 
but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service, though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost, the chief. <clears throat> but I received mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, may the Lord bless his holy and inspired and sacred word to our hearts as I read it in your hearing this morning. Let's come to him in prayer. Let us all pray. <clears throat> we bow before you, O gracious Lord, our loving Heavenly Father, and thank you that on this Palm Sunday we can remember the time when the Lord Jesus Christ rode triumphantly into Jerusalem. And yet within a few days, uh, he was taken by wicked hands and crucified and slain. And yet as we know these things and as we know this truth and as we think of them so much at this time of the year, we are reminded uh, by your scripture and by the hymn that we have sung of this wonderful love that you demonstrated to us coming from the heart of the Father above in the name and through the person of, your, of, of, the, of God the Son, the Lord Jesus the Savior who came to tell of this gospel, who came joyfully and willingly and readily. He came to dwell with those who were helpless and hopeless, and that is us. Without Christ, that's where we are. Oh, gracious God, help us to understand these things again this morning as we consider them. We thank you for this glorious gospel of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We thank you that the Lord Jesus was willing to share our sorrow and our shame, to take our punishment, to bear away our sins. He came seeking the lost, but not merely seeking them, to save them and redeem them at measureless cost. And what he came to do when he came to this earth, he is still doing, as our hymn reminded us, seeking those who are wandering away from him, seeking those who are far from him, Oh, gracious God, we pray that yet in these days you will come in mighty, convicting and converting power and save men and women and boys and girls and bring this wonderful love of God into the hearts of those who are without hope and without God in this world. We pray to you, our God. We live in a world of wickedness. We live in a world of terrible things that are happening. We are uh, uh, saddened and grieved by what is happening in Ukraine at this time, uh, the wanton destruction and wanton murder uh, and, uh, and killing of, of uh, so many civilians uh, in this uh, what seems to be mindless and wicked war. Oh, gracious God, hear our prayer for peace in our time. And yet help us not to be, uh, we are taken up with Ukraine and that's right and proper. But let us not be uh, unmindful of uh, other terrible atrocities going other, on in other parts of the world as well. We are aware of many, many people who have lost their lives uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, Myanmar, in Burma, uh, and in other places. The war that is continuing in Yemen, which hardly ever hits our headlines. Uh, the the uh, murdering and the opposition to uh, Christian work and witness 
uh, in parts of Ethiopia and in uh, many places in the Middle East and certainly in China. Oh, gracious God, hear our prayer for our brothers and sisters who are facing persecution and opposition and in some cases death and destruction because they love the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, gracious God, hear our prayer. We live in a wicked world, an evil world. And we live in a world and a land uh, here in the West which has, uh, by and large, uh, not only forsaken, but deliberately despises your word and its truth and the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us, our Father, to understand these things more and more in these days, that we may find in the Lord Jesus forgiveness and grace and those of us who know you and love you, that we may be built up in our most holy faith and seek, in spite of the wickedness all around us, to live holy, godly, Christ-like lives. So hear our prayer this day, we pray. We pray for those in this fellowship we do not know, or at least I do not know, uh, the burdens that maybe many bear or the bereavements that people have faced, the pressures that come upon us. Oh, gracious God, we thank you that you are the God who hears and answers our prayers. You are the God of comfort and mercy to those who sorrow. Come, oh, gracious God, again and do us good as we look to you. Help us, we pray. We pray for our land and nation. We pray for our government. We pray for our queen and those in authority. Your word commands us to do that, and it is indeed our joy and pleasure and right to do these things, that you will come yet and save those in high places and give us honorable and godly people to lead us and guide us uh, and to direct our, our nation and our land in these days. Hear our prayer, we pray, and sanctify to us the things of the gospel. And bless this, little, this, uh, this fellowship here uh, in, in Potton, and may your good hand remain upon your people in this place, and May the word of God continue to be preached with power and with authority and with the Holy Spirit sent down from heaven and that many may yet hear the light of the light and the glory of the gospel of the grace of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So go with us this morning, we pray, and watch over us throughout this day, your day. Uh, we thank you that we have one day and seven set aside for the worship of your great and holy name. Do us good, our God, and in all that we do this day, may the Lord Jesus Christ be honored and worshipped and praised uh, from uh, hearts that are right with him, saved by the grace of God, cleansed by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus. So hear our prayer, we pray, and do us good, for we ask all these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. And now we're going to turn to number 483, 483. We have a gospel to proclaim, good news to, for men in all the earth. The gospel of a Savior's name, we sing his glory, tell his worth. I don't know this man, Edward Burns. Uh, I remember a good many years ago driving back uh, from preaching, uh, this was probably when we were still down in, in St. Ives, driving back from preaching away uh, on one Sunday and turning on, I don't even think it's broadcast any longer, but there used to be a hymn singing program on, on one of the radio uh, channels um, at I think half eight to nine o'clock, I don't know if, even if it's still on. Um, and I remember hearing this hymn and thinking, wow, I've never heard this hymn before. What a wonderful hymn it was. What wonderful words. And I thought, this is amazing that the BBC is, is, is broadcasting a hymn so good. <laughs> and I thought, when I get home, I'll have to find out who wrote it. Well, I found it out. And now it's, in the new, it's not in the old Christian hymns, but it's in the new Christian hymns. Uh, and I've come to love it, and I've met it a number of times. We had it printed on the overhead uh, down in St. Ives um, and on, on, uh, on, uh, on a hymn sheet. Um, in the church where I was uh, more latterly, uh, but it's now, uh, now in this book, so great words. We have a gospel to proclaim, good news for men in all the earth, 483, thank you. <laughs>
Please would you turn in the scriptures to 1 Timothy chapter 1, 1 Timothy chapter 1, uh, and verse 11 is my text, and uh, forgive me, I'm going to use the New King James uh, for uh, preaching, although um, I'm very pleased at the way uh, the ESV translates these words uh, of chapter, uh, verse 11, uh, where we read these words, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. Uh, and um, uh, more colloquially, uh, as the ESV has it, in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God, the gospel of the glory of the blessed God, the glorious gospel of the blessed God. Uh, and um, this is a wonderful statement that Paul makes here uh, in the context of this chapter. Now, Paul is writing here to, uh, to contrast uh, and to counteract the heretics uh, that have crept into the church unawares uh, here in this first chapter. Their heresies uh, developed into what became known as Gnosticism. Now, uh, please forgive me if that's a long word which you don't know. Uh, G-N-O-S-T-I-C. ISM Gnosticism. The, the G is a, is a sort of almost a silent G. It comes from the Greek word ginosko, which means to know. And what they claimed was special insider knowledge. Now, uh, to some extent, they had a point. Because those of us who are Christians, we have, we might say, special knowledge. We have wonderful knowledge of the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he is our perfect Savior and Lord. Uh, in a sense, the world knows nothing about that until somebody comes face to face with the gospel and comes to understand what God has done. They are in darkness. They are, as uh, Paul says in Ephesians, without God and without hope in the world. I think they're some of the most dreadful, awesome words in the whole of Scripture for a man or woman, a boy or girl, to be without God and without hope. That's terrible. So there is a sense in which when we come to Christ, we have a wonderful knowledge of the glory of God. But the Gnostics had distorted this truth. And what they said was they were the only people with the real truth that nobody else really understood. And what they're doing is they're arguing they're arguing that, uh, that they have a, a greater understanding of what God uh, wants from us. And their teaching rested very much upon the fact that matter is evil, but the spirit is good. So matter is evil. So the body, matter, the things of this world are evil. God is going to destroy this, this world at the last and bring in the new heavens and the new earth uh, that was their argument and so on. But it, it led to a number of major, major errors. Let me just mention five of them quickly because you'll see how dangerous their teaching was. Firstly, man's body, because it's a matter, physical body, is evil. That is in contrast to God uh, who is Holy Spirit. Now, of course, to some extent, we may say, well, yeah, yeah, men, ungodly men and women, they, they, they are evil, and what they do is evil. We see that, don't we, in, in Ukraine at the moment, and some of the things that are happening in the world, and we see the evil of man. But they went further than that. They were saying that only God is good, but man is evil. Now, the consequence of that was that what was salvation? Well, to them, then, it was to escape from the body, to be delivered from the body. And that was achieved by this special knowledge, this gnosis uh, uh, knowledge. Now, that led to a third thing. If matter is evil, then the Lord Jesus Christ could not have been fully human. Because how could he be fully human if matter is evil? Now, that leads to two major, major errors which the early church had to deal with. One was called du docetism. That is saying that Christ only seemed to be human, that he walked about with a human, what seemed to be like a human body, but really he was an android. He wasn't really a fully human in that sense. That was docetism. That was a dangerous heresy which was dealt with in the early, in the early years of the church. Or the other 
uh, thing was that the Lord Jesus Christ became divine at his baptism and then became man again just before he died. Now, I have heard that. I, I actually, when I was uh, um, probably in my early 20s, I heard a man propose that. I won't name the church. It was an, a, a, a quite a well-known church uh, in this country. Um, and the man was putting this forward, and every thought, everyone thought, what a marvelous message this was. And what he said was, when the Lord Jesus Christ was baptized, God the Holy Spirit came upon him. And then on the cross, when he prayed, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, the Holy Spirit left him. So he simply died as a mere man. My friends, that's blasphemy. That's not what the Bible teaches. That's error. And that was the other, that was the other, that was the other result of this Gnostic teaching. Now, John, John the disciple, deals with some of the incipient heresies here in 1 and 2 John in his epistles. Uh, and you can see some of that there. And if you wanted to study those in more detail, he answers them. He knocks them on the head. That didn't stop the Gnostics carrying on. The fourth thing that came from this was that since the body was evil, well, it didn't matter what we do to the body. We can abuse the body. It doesn't really matter. Therefore, fifthly, because there was no moral restraint, God's law only applies spiritually and not to matter. So if you want to get drunk, you go and get drunk because the body doesn't matter. If you want to tattoo yourself, you do that because it doesn't, the body doesn't matter. If you want to smoke yourself to, or live to, you know, have drugs, it doesn't matter because the body is, is, is evil. If you wanted to enjoy yourself in all kinds of sexual immorality, which is what the Gnostics did, uh, then you go ahead and enjoy it because uh, the body is evil and it doesn't matter. My friends, that's wicked. That's wicked. That's not what the Bible teaches. And it was a clever way of denying God's law and then rejecting it. And so the Gnostics denied the reality of the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ. They said that he could not have been properly divine. Knowledge to them was more important than conduct. That meant that brilliant gifts implied superiority to the law. We see that, don't we, today? People say one law for the rich and another law for the poor. That's good Gnostic teaching. And it's seen today when people act as though they are above the law, that it doesn't apply to them. They have superior knowledge. They don't need to do what the general masses have to do. They can live a different life because they're not bound by the law. Now, that's happened in history over and over again. I don't know whether you know much about art. I'm not a great uh, fan of modern art. I don't understand some of these, these uh, crazy splashes of paint. And people say, oh, isn't it wonderful? It looks like this. And I think it looks like a fried egg that's not been properly cooked or something like that. <laughs> forgive me, you know. Uh, forgive me if you're an artist, you know. But there we are. Well, anyway, Cellini. Cellini was a goldsmith and an artist of a previous generation. Cellini committed murder. You read the life story of Cellini. It's not, very, it's not very pleasant. In fact, it's pretty, pretty nasty. He killed his brother's killer, the man who killed his brother. He went out and killed him. Now, to some extent, you can, you, you can say, well, you can understand that if somebody killed my brother. Well, I don't think I'd go and kill him. But, you know, you can understand perhaps that to some extent. But actually, it was an act of cold-blooded murder. It wasn't justice. It wasn't properly done by justice. He then went on to kill a rival goldsmith because he didn't want him as his rival. He then boasted of other people he had wounded. But people thought Cellini was a wonderful artist, so they turned a blind eye to all his, his evils and all his wickedness uh, to his crimes. And even the Pope gave him a pardon so that he could continue working and people could enjoy his art and his sculptures and all the rest of it and his work with gold uh, because they wanted his talents. They thought that he, it doesn't matter, let him be above the law. Now that is terrible, my friends. Wickedness is wickedness. Murder is murder. And a man may be incredibly gifted, but he, he commits murder. He should have the consequence of them. 
And what happens today, we see it, don't we, in politics and in other ways. People are, uh, they fall from office. Uh, and maybe they do fall from office and they're out of thing. But within a few years, they're reinstated with no sign of repentance. And the prevailing philosophy seems to be, it doesn't matter what you do, providing you can get away with it. My friends, that is a hopeless philosophy. A hopeless philosophy. Our only hope, because we're all guilty, is to be found in the glorious gospel of the blessed God. And that's the context of these words here. Just look at the chapter with me briefly. I'm not going to give you an extended Bible study of the chapter, but just very briefly. Verse 3, as I urged you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus, that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Paul is concerned. He gives to Timothy a timely warning against error and the novelties for the sake of any teaching. And what he is saying is, don't teach any other doctrine because error is irrelevant. It is dangerous. It is spurious. It'll lead you astray. It'll never save your soul. Verse 4, never give heed to fables and endless genealogies which cause disputes rather than godly edification, which is faith. So often our words are merely godless chatter. They are unedifying is our conversation that which builds people up, that builds up their faith and encourages them? Are we, are, we, are we able to indulge in what we might call godly edification? Paul deals with that. Verse 5, there is a discipline to true faith. The purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith. How do you produce a pure heart and a good conscience and sincere faith? By discipline. Now that's important. I was, having, I was in a, a, a minister's meeting yesterday on Zoom and we were discussing some of these. We were talking about the, 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 the importance of God's sovereignty and uh, our responsibility to live according to God's l laws. And that as we, as Christians, as we live... All that we do is 100% of God, but it's also 100% of us. We are to work at our salvation in that sense. We are to strive for godliness because it is God who works in us. And that's the wonder of the gospel. To produce a pure heart and a good conscience and sincere faith. Verses 6 to 7, some have turned aside from this. What have they said? They say, this is too hard, it's too demanding. I can't keep it up. Well, yes, you can't in your own strength. That's why you need the gospel. Verses 8 to 10, Paul deals with the purpose of the law. What is the purpose of the law? To show up wrongdoing, to restrain evil doers, to demonstrate justice. As one person has written, law is like a medicine given to be applied to the moral disease. Sound doctrine is like wholesome food for healthy people. I like that. Law is like a medicine. Now, we may not like medicine, but it does us good. Sound doctrine is like wholesome food. Are you going back to Sunday lunch and wholesome? Well, I don't know. Maybe you're not. Maybe you're just going to have, you know, maybe you're just going to have bread and water. I don't know. But, you know, wholesome food. It's good. It builds you up and it's enjoyable. There's nothing wrong with enjoying your food. What were the purposes of the sacrifices in the Old Testament? Some of them, of course, were the burnt offering and they were completely burnt off up. But the other sacrifices, they were sacrificed but then the people God provided for their enjoyment and for their feasting. You remember those incredible words in Nehemiah when after they had uh, come to realize that they had not kept God's law and they mourn and weep about it in, in Nehemiah 8. What did Nehemiah and Ezra do? They come to them and they said, do not weep. This is a day for rejoicing. Eat the fat, enjoy the food, rejoice. We are going to sacrifice again as we did. And it's a time of rejoicing and praise. Why? Because our sins are forgiven and we have everything to rejoice in. 
wonderful. Now, of course, we don't eat our Sunday lunch, you know, and the you know, nice roast dinner and all, and we don't think, but, but the, 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 the point is, there is pleasure to be had in the good things that God has given to us in this world. And that's the point of that uh, verses 9 and 10. Law like a medicine to deal with a disease, but sound doctrine like wholesome food. South, sound doctrine, Paul says, conforms to the gospel of the glory of the blessed God. In him is perfection of bliss, the splendor of his glory. Now, with that lengthy introduction, let me come to the main part of what I want to say this morning. And I want to ask this question and seek to answer it. Why is this gospel so glorious? And as we think of this on this Palm Sunday, and we think of the Lord Jesus Christ riding into Jerusalem and then to face the cross to take away our sins, how wonderful is this? Why is this gospel so glorious? Well, I want to give you four uh, things I think briefly this morning is four things. Firstly, because it is God's gospel. Because it is God's gospel. Man didn't invent it. It came from God. God, the source of truth, the source of blessedness, the source of glory. God is truth, truth in himself. Therefore, we must declare this truth. We mustn't reinterpret it. We mustn't alter it. We mustn't change it. We mustn't try and make it more satisfying to us. We must declare it because the gospel is not a guess or an opinion or a possibility or a probability. The gospel does not contain the truth or is partly true, nor is to be added to other ideas. It is essentially the truth of the glory of God. It is all true. It is the only gospel that will save men and women. It is the only gospel of the blessed God committed to our trust. Absolute truth, certain truth. It is God's gospel. Secondly, because it reveals the true character of God. Now, the Bible, of course, has a lot to tell us about the character and nature of God. And God, uh, Paul tells us of this in Romans chapter 1, where he's talking about God's wrath against unrighteousness and ungodliness of men. Um, because he says, verse 19, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. And then he describes this. And in this middle of this passage of great judgment, there is this great light about the true character of God, Romans 1 verse 20. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. And then he goes on to show the folly of those who reject these things. What is he saying? Well, he is reminding us that God is the great creator God. He is the God who has made this world. His, uh, his being, his mind, his character, his nature, his awesome and all-powerful will. That is fearsome, my friends. He is the God of purity and justice and holiness. He is the maker, the ruler, the upholder and sustainer of all. He is the unseen master of the universe. Now, there is a sense in which we fear that which is unseen and unknown. I don't know about you, but um, when the place is dark and you don't know what's happening, and maybe you go out and you want, and then you, you hear a noise, and well, maybe, maybe, you're, maybe you're just very brave and you, it doesn't worry you. But I think a lot of people, you know, they can get concerned, they don't know what's happening. And there is a sense when we come into the presence of God, as uh, one, uh, uh, one uh, preacher I heard many years ago say this, we are in the presence of an unfamiliar reality. There's something very real about God. Of course there is, because he is essentially reality itself. But we, he is unfamiliar to us. We do not understand the, 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 his works 
The Old Testament talks about the edges of his ways, the skirts of his garments, as though we only know a tiny little bit about God. There's something that is awesome and frightening in one sense about God, which is why the Bible tells us that we are to fear God, with, not, with, not with a frightened fear, but with reverence and with awe, because he is the great, mighty God, the all-powerful, all-wise, but also the all-merciful and all-gracious God. And he is the, the God who has revealed himself to us. And that is wonderful, you know, because if God hadn't told us his gospel, we wouldn't know it. How would we ever know it? You look at all the religions in the world. There is no other religion in the world like the gospel. It is unique. The whole sense of... Every other religion in the world, as Dr. Lloyd-Jones used to say, is man trying to reach God. But the gospel of the grace of God is that God has come down to man. No other religion has that in the world. And when the New Testament uses the word mystery, when we talk about mystery, we think about, well, I don't know you, I, I sort of think about um, Detective stories, you know, Agatha Christie and that, well, it's probably too old for some of you, but, you know, that kind of thing. Um, you know, mystery, well, we don't know any, you know, and then, then they weave these stories and it's a wonderful mystery and there are all sorts of people who have written it. But the Bible, when it uses mystery, doesn't use it in that sense. Mystery in the Bible is something that we could not have known if God didn't tell us. And the wonder is, and Paul uses this over and over again when he uses the word mystery uh, in Ephesians and Colossians and, well, in lots of places in his writings. What he is doing is he's saying God has revealed it to us. We know the mystery. If we're in Christ, we understand it. We understand what God has come to do. God has given to us, and so Paul calls it the glorious mystery of the work of Christ because God has told us. He's let us into the secret, if you understand. That's the sense of it. It's not something that we can never, it's something that he has told us. My friends, can you imagine any other, any other religion talking about the fact that here are people that have offended against the God whom they worship and the God whom he, they worship has sent his own son to take away our penalty and our sin. God takes our punishment upon himself. That is amazing. That is incredible when you think about it. It is so far and away beyond anything that anybody could have invented. Here is a gospel that reveals the character of God. What a God. What a gospel. What a saviour. Hallelujah, what a saviour. Thirdly, because this gospel reveals the true purpose of life. The true purpose of life. Man is created, man, mankind, male and female. When I say man, as the Bible uses it, we're talking about male and female. We're not missing you out, ladies, bless you. Of course not. Male and female, created in the image of God, we are made and created for eternity. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ in Mark's gospel uh, says this as he instructs his disciples, Mark 8, verses 36 to 37, for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Why? Because we have an immortal soul. And that is why Christ came to save. You go back in the uh, scriptures. Uh, we won't stop with it now. But you go back to 2 Corinthians and chapter 5. I, I love these words in Corinthians which speak about the wonder of what it is to be reconciled to God. And the glory that comes 
from that. And Paul has been speaking about the wonder of our light affliction, which is but for a moment working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. And then he says, here we are in this earth and we groan, longing to be clothed with our house that is from heaven, looking forward to that time <coughs> when we will see him. And he goes on to say that this is the great hope of the Christian. What is it? Well, it's fear for the non-Christian, but it's hope for the Christian. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are well known to God. And I also trust are well known to your consciences. And then he goes on to, to speak of this. And he talks about the love of Christ that compels us because we judge that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all that those who live should no, live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again and go on. Therefore, anyone, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself and so on. A credible, wonderful, glorious Paul takes this up a little bit in this chapter that we're looking here in 1 Timothy. Of course, he does it, it does it at greater length in that passage in Corinthians. But in 1 Timothy, just a little bit later in verses 15 to 17, he talks about uh, that our only hope being in the gospel, the faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And that's how he has obtained mercy. True believers love the law of God because they love the God of the law. They love true doctrine. That's the point of verse 10. Uh, anything else that is contrary to sound doctrine, true believers love true doctrine because sound doctrine demands that we keep the law of God but gives us the strength to do so in Christ. It reveals our sinful condition, our lostness, our hopelessness but it also declares a way of salvation, of deliverance, of forgiveness, of mercy, and of grace. How do we know that we're unrighteous? Because the law of God has been revealed to us. We're all unrighteous until God comes to us and grants us the righteousness of Christ. And even then our righteousness is an imputed righteousness. It is the gift of God. That's why Paul has been showing that the law is for us all. The law makes us aware of our own sinfulness and the glory of God's grace. The law reveals to us the extent of Christ's righteousness and obedience. That's the point of what he's saying in verses 8 and 9 and following. But this is why this gospel is such a glorious gospel. And only in this true glorious gospel do we learn the true purpose of life. Mankind was made for God and his glory. And only in this glorious gospel of salvation can we know the truth as it is in the Lord Jesus. Now I have one more thing to say, my friends. We've seen that it is God's gospel. We've seen that it reveals the true character of God. We've said that it is because it reveals the true purpose of life. Here is the fourth thing about this glorious gospel. Why do we believe it? Because it works. Because it works. How does this gospel work? It works through the Lord Jesus Christ. Through his incarnation, his life, his death, his resurrection. Paul has demonstrated that, of course, in those words we were looking at in 2 Corinthians a moment or two ago. He who is sinless, the Lord Jesus Christ, sinless and perfect, and therefore he is able to pay the price to set his people free. Listen to 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For he, that is God the Father, made him, that is God the Son, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. There is a transference that takes place. God takes our sins and put them, puts them upon his Son. 
and God takes his son's righteousness and puts it upon us. It works. He paid the price to set us free. And he represents us before the Father in heaven. That's why Paul goes on uh, in the end of chapter 5 and in chapter 6 to go on to say, In an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. This gospel is a glorious gospel. But my friends, it is a glorious gospel because the God of this gospel is glorious. Do you get the point? Beware, lest we transfer the glory of God to the gospel itself. The gospel is glorious, but it is glorious because God is glorious, because it is God's gospel. That's the point. And what do we read? It is the glorious gospel of the blessed God. What is the word blessed? It's the Greek word makarios. It is the happy God. Now this Greek word makarios is only used here and in 1 Timothy 6 verse 15 with regard to God. 1 Timothy 6 verse 15, he uh, he, Christ, and the Lord, the only potentate, King of kings, he who is the blessed and only potentate, King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, and, and so on. This is only used here and in 1 Timothy 6.15 with regard to God. But it is also the word that is used by our Lord Jesus Christ in the Beatitudes, this God who brings happiness to his people. The blessings of God. You read about them in the Beatitudes. They're wonderful. This God brings happiness to those who follow him. You know, I don't know whether you've heard this, but I've, I heard, used to hear this regularly when I was a child and when I was, a, when I was working in industry. And people would come up to me and they'd t talk about these miserable Christians. And I used to think, why are Christians miserable? We've got no reason to be miserable. Oh, I know we have the cares of this world and we're fighting against sin and all the rest. And I'm not denying that. But there is a joy and a happiness and a glory about this gospel that the world knows nothing about. Why? Because this is the gospel of the blessed God, of the happy God. This is true happiness. It's found in him. It is a happiness, a blessedness that is an attribute of God. It is not just God's disposition, not just his emotion, but his very character, his attitudes, his quality. The God who is essentially blessed as he is essentially holy. Now, my friends, if that is the case, that makes obedience to his law a happy thing. It is what makes men happy. The righteous, the Bible tells us, are greatly blessed when they are committed to the law of God. By that law, they have received grace and they come to know God who radiates splendor and glory and wonder through the gospel. What a privilege to be entrusted with such a gospel. What a great thing it is to know such a God, such a Lord. Our only hope of glory is if Christ is in us. Do you remember those wonderful words in Colossians Chapter 1, speaking of these things, it is, I often feel this with Colossians, you get it a little bit in Ephesians as well, as though, as, as though Paul is sort of winding up the, winding up the, the, the not the tension, but winding up the, the expression of joy, and he's, he's sort of getting going, and the more he gets going, the more thrilled he is with it, and the more wonderful it is, and the more great it is. And you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind, Colossians chapter 1, verse 21, 
by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight, if indeed you continue in the faith grounded and steadfast and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven of which I, Paul, became a minister, and he's, he's piling on the blessings and the glory. I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God which was given from and so on. The mystery which has been hidden from the ages and from generations but now has been revealed in his saints. You see what I was saying about mystery earlier on. To them God will to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ. To this end I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily wonderful. Do you know this God, my friend? Do you know this Savior? Do you know this glorious gospel of the blessed God? My friends, what are you doing with this gospel? What are you doing as you are confronted with this glorious God? What are you doing as you think of the Lord Jesus Christ, God the Son, in all that he did to bring this glorious gospel of the blessed God to you? Oh, my friend, do not turn your back upon it. Do not reject this gospel. This gospel works. I became a Christian when I was seven years old as a little boy. I've let the Lord down many times. He's never let me down. And I'm now in my mid-70s. So I've had nearly 70 years of following the Lord Jesus. My friends, it's worth it. It works. It's wonderful. It's glorious. I'm not saying everything in my life has been wonderful. I've faced many pressures and many burdens. But God the Lord is, I am so glad that I came to know and understand about him when I was a child. If you are not a Christian, my friend, forgive me. Well, no, I don't forgive me. You are a fool. You're a fool. You are. That's what the Bible describes you. If that offends you, I'm sorry. I don't mean to offend you. But if you know the Lord, what a God, what a glory, what a savior. Praise his name. This is the glorious gospel of the blessed God. What are you doing with this glorious gospel of the blessed God? Well, we're going to sing a hymn which takes up these things so wonderfully. I hope I've got, I got the wrong number. Oh, yes, we have. I think we've got the right. Yes, that's right. This is the hymn. 538. I, I suddenly panicked that I got the wrong number on my book because when I looked it up, I thought that wasn't the hymn I wanted. But you have got the right one, so I'm glad I gave you the right one. Come, sinners, to the gospel feast. Let every soul be Jesus' guest. Ye need not one be left behind, for God has bidden all my, mankind. Look at verse 4. His love is mighty to compel. His conquering love consent to feel. Yield to his love's resistless power and fight against your God no more. Well, may these words be a blessing. 538. <clears throat>
We thank you, our love, loving and have glorious Heavenly Father, for the wonder of this glorious gospel of the blessed God. We thank you for the, wo the work the, the, that the Lord Jesus did for us as he came to this world, as he not only lived among us, but died upon the cross and then rose again, triumphant and victorious, to bring to us the satisfaction and the glory that his finished work was complete and the resurrection ratifies that. And as we gather next Lord's Day to remember that on Easter Sunday, we pray that these truths will become even more wonderful and precious to us. We thank you for your love that is mighty to compel. We pray that your conquering love we will consent to feel and yield to that love's resistless power and fight against our God no more. Come, O oh gracious God, we thank you that in Christ there is a hearty welcome to all who will come and hear and receive this glorious gospel of the blessed God. Do us good, we pray, and hear our prayer for Jesus' sake. Amen. <laughs>